Okay. So here's a function. It's a function that consists of one, two, three, four points. And they're unconnected. So just four points. So this is a really good opportunity to review what domain and range are. See, domain is the set of all the X coordinates. So that would be negative nine and negative seven and negative two and five. And the range is the set of all the Y coordinates. That would be negative eight, negative six, negative four, and negative five. And that's the domain and range of F of X. The four unconnected points. Now, we're going to talk about the inverse function of f of x. What is an inverse function? Well, technically, an inverse function, and this is the uh, symbol for an inverse function, inverse It contains all the points that f of x contains, but in reversed order. That is, the y, see here's the first point. The y coordinate for f of x is going to become the x coordinate of f inverse of x and the X coordinate of F of X becomes the Y coordinate of F inverse of X. And it's that way all along the line. Negative six becomes the X coordinate. Negative seven becomes the Y coordinate. So that's the way it's going to be for all four of these points. Okay, as a result, the domain of F inverse of X is going to be negative eight, negative six, negative four, negative five. And the range of F inverse of X is going to be negative nine, negative seven, negative two and five. So if you notice this, let's see, let's write, these are the domain and range of F inverse of X. There. 
the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x, and the range of f of x is the domain of f inverse of x, which I think is absolutely wild. So one of the most important properties of inverses is that they, they, they reverse, if you will, they switch, there you go, they switch domains and ranges. Okay, now we're going to talk about, for a minute, one-to-one -one functions. Because only, only one-to-one -one functions have inverses. So let us write that down because it's very, very important. Only one-to-one -one functions have inverse functions. So we have to look at, well, okay, what is a one-to-one -one function? And let's look at this. Let's look at y equals 5x minus 2. Waiting for the calculator. Okay, clear. Clear. 5x minus 2, was that it? Five X minus two. Okay, we're going to graph Y equals five X minus two. Of course, this is the slope and this is the Y intercept. So it's easy enough to graph but I would rather do it on a calculator to get a better picture. So five, uh, uh, five X minus two graph. Okay, so I am going to just take a little picture of that and put it in the notes. Okay, there you go. This is y equals 5x minus 2. Right there. Okay, we know it's a function. We know it's a function because it passes the vertical line test. Where you draw a vertical line through the graph, and if the vertical line only touches the graph at one point, we would say intersects the graph at one point, then this is a function, right? That's the vertical line test. So 
say it passes. Passes the vertical line test. So y equals 5x minus 2 is a function But is it one-to-one? -one? There's another test. The horizontal line test. Okay, it does pass the horizontal line test. I'm going to write down what that is. Okay, a horizontal line drawn through any part of the graph intersects the graph at only one point. It's like the vertical line test, only it's a horizontal line. Ms. Barbara? Yes. So does it have to pass both of these tests for it to be considered one-to-one -one or just one of them? Um, well, it has to be a function to be a one-to-one -one function. Okay. So, so yeah, it has to pass both. Okay. Um, yeah, it intersects the graph at only one point. A horizontal line drawn through any part of the graph intersects the graph at only one point. Now I'm going to show you a very um, um, familiar graph that is a function, but it's not a one-to-one -one function. Clear this. Y equals X squared is not one-to-one, -one, and I'll show you. So there's the graph of y equals x squared. There it is. You just never know where these guys are gonna show up. Okay, this is y equals, oops, wait a minute. This is y equals x squared. Okay, we know it's a function. It definitely passes the vertical line test. 
passes the VLT. So that's not a problem. Uh, y equals x squared is a function. However, and that's a very big however, however, y equals x square fails, a big fail. y equals x, x square fails the HLT, which is the horizontal line test. So sad. If you take an upper level class, you will find that there's a certain trick that can be used. But we're not going to go over it here unless we have a lot of time left over. All right, here is the horizontal line test. OK. Um, anywhere up here. This horizontal line intersects the graph at two points. That makes y equals x squared not one to one. Oh, what the heck, I'll tell you. However, somebody got the brilliant idea. Well, okay. I mean, th that's over its whole domain, right? I mean, it's going to be a U, except right there at the very bottom. It's going to be a U. So it doesn't, it won't ever pass the horizontal line test. But, but what if we performed a nasty little stunt like this? What if we only took half of it? I'm going to do that. What if we only took half of its domain? What if we only took half of the domain from zero, well, flatten from zero to infinity? What if we only took half of it? Then it would pass the horizontal line test. So you see mathematicians can be very, very sneaky. Now, if you are very careful, and if you specify, if you specify that the domain of y equals x squared is zero to infinity, or let's put that in parentheses, or the domain
is negative infinity to zero, the other half, one half or the other, then y equals x squared is one to one. Pretty darn sneaky. Then, that's not a capital T. I should say that part. Then that part of y equals x squared is one to one. So that part of it can have an inverse. Which I think is pretty darn sneaky. Nobody's going to ask you that in this class. And you won't even think about that unless you take calculus. And then you are going to talk about it. But don't worry now. I'm just telling you because I thought you might be interested. We'll just deal with this one, and this one is not one-to-one. -one. Whereas something like this is one-to-one. -one. So the whole reason we care is that means that this has an inverse, but this, when it's a U like that, does not have an inverse only if you take half of it. So, so, sneaky little math tricks. Let's talk about how you find an inverse function. They say relation, but an inverse function for a one-to-one -one function. We showed that this function is one to one. Is one to one, therefore. Y equals five X minus two. Or F of X equals. Five X minus two can be written either way. They're <clears throat> one or the other. It has an inverse. We can find out what that inverse is. Okay, let's find it. Let's start with f of x, because there are some steps you have to follow. Most of the time, functions are written like this. So step one, is to change the f of x to y. So this was already at step one. Okay, now this is the hardest step to remember to do. Are you ready? Okay. We have to switch the X and the Y. The reason for that is that Inverse functions switch all their X's and Y's. So switch the X at the X's and Y's. Okay. 
there. Now, step three, and this can take a long time sometimes, or it can be real short like this one. We're going to solve for Y. Bothers me. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing I'll do is add two to both sides. Because I, I need to get rid of that two. Okay, so I make it equal zero on this side. But I have to do the same exact thing to both sides of the equation. It's good to be reminded of that sometimes. I bring down the 5y. Well, 5y plus 0 is uh, 5. Never mind. Forget I said anything. Um, x plus 2 is going to equal 5y plus 0, which is 5y. Now I can solve for y if I divide both sides by 5. So y equals, because these cancel, y equals x plus 2 over 5. Or, remembering that we're dealing with a straight line up here, we can turn this into a straight line by writing x plus 2 over 5 as 1x plus 2 over 5, and then 1x over 5 plus 2 over 5, and then taking the 1 fifth there and moving it to the front, 1 fifth x plus two-fifths. So you can write it either way, but now we can officially say that f inverse of x, the inverse function of f of x, equals either that or that. This is the symbol, the symbol for inverse function. So it's just a symbol, remember that. Now let's find the inverse. We're gonna go back and graph these so you can see what they look like together. But right now, um, let's find the inverse of f of x equals the seventh root of x minus four. Okay, well, step one. Oh, I didn't check to see if it's one to one. Let's look. Actually, I already know that the calculator won't give a very good picture, but we're going to try anyway. So I click seven because that's the root. I mean, that's the the index that I want to use. And then math. And then I have to go down to five or just hit five. 
and look what happens. The seven jumps up to the inverse position. Then under the radical I type, what do I type? X minus four. And then hit the right arrow key. And then I'm going to graph. OK. I'm going to zoom six that to put it back in standard form. OK, notice that the graph is slowly going up. So it's not flat. It's slowly tilting up. And then this doesn't go vertically up because then it wouldn't be a function. It instead it, it tilts. And then it starts tilting up again. So for that reason, this does pass the horizontal line test. So this is one to one. Therefore, it has an inverse function. So now we can write step one. Y equals the seventh root of X minus four. Step two, you switch the X and the Y. So X equals the seventh root of Y minus four. And now we have to solve for Y. Well, Y is trapped right now under a seventh root radical. Oh, what to do? Well, we have the key to the locked door. We are going to take both sides of this equation and raise both sides to the seventh power. I really didn't need parentheses here because after all, there is only one term, just an X. So let's just do that. Raise this side to the seventh term and raise this side to the seventh term. Now, the reason I do that is that what this does is, remember that we can always write this with a rational exponent. Let's just say the seventh root of five. How about that? Change it, change the problem a little bit. The seventh root of five can also be written as five to the one seventh power. So if for some reason I had the seventh root of five raised to the seventh power, that would be the same thing as five to the seven over seven. I just picked five out of the air. Um, seven over seven is one, so that would be five to the one power, which is just five. So that's what's going to happen here. I have y minus four underneath the seventh root radical. So now I can also write this as that seven on top and that seven on the bottom. 
and seven over seven is one. So this is y minus four to the one power, which is just y minus four. So x to the seventh power equals y minus four. Then to solve for y, all I have to do is add four to both sides. Negative four plus four is zero. Bring down the y. y equals x to the seventh power plus four. That was supposed to be, ah, this is step three where I try to solve for y. So step three, oops, oops, oops. Step four, is where you make this official. F inverse of X equals X to the seventh power plus four. Although quite honestly, my math lab usually does step four for you. You don't have to write this. Instead, you'll have F inverse of X equals, and then you'll write X to the seventh power plus four. Now, I want you to see the graph of these, of this, and this, um, I guess since I wrote this as a, in a blue box, I'll let this be blue. And I will let this be red. Well, why did I write it that way then? Think, Barbara, think. Oh, it's bad for my head. Well, yeah, there is that, okay. Red. And we're going to graph this right here. Oh, I've already got this. Though. Yeah, I've already got it. Well, guess what? It's blue. But I know. I used to know a way to switch the colors, but I forget. So I'll have to find that out later. Instead, I'm just going to, I am being forced against my will, sort of, to change this. So bear with me. Okay. Now, this is already blue. through no fault of my own, this is going to be red. So there, huh? Now, here we have that. And I really would like this to look a little more slanted. So I'm going to play with the window just to try to give you a better view, okay? Well, that doesn't work very well. A little better. 
a little better. OK, now. X to the seventh plus four. So X carrot seven. No, that's not an X. That's this is an X there now. Plus four. We're going to graph that now in red. OK, there are the two graphs. And notice they're kind of like a mirror image of each other. I'm going to go back to Y equals and I'm going to graph a third function, the line Y equals X. All you have to do is type in X and then hit graph. Now I'm going to take a picture of this and put it on the paper and then tell you what all this means. That would be better. That's the best. Okay. You know, to try to make it look like what it really would look like in real life. OK, now. This is the seventh root of X minus four. And this is its inverse, X to the seventh power plus four. And this line, I guess I should say F of X, shouldn't I? All right f of x, this equals f of x. And this equals f inverse of x. And right there, smack dab in the middle is the line f of x equals x. Or let's just say it the way we usually say it, which is not that. The way we usually think of it is y equals x. This is the line y equals x. Here's a secret of the universe. Inverse function, the graphs of inverse functions. are mirror images of each other. Across the line, y equals x. 
that will always be true. Let's graph um, y equals 5x minus 2 and 1 fifth x plus 2. Okay, so this is 5x minus 2. And this is 1 fifth x plus 2 fifths. Is it plus? I forget, I forget. Yeah, it is plus two. But it's not plus two. I lied to you. It's two fifths. Don't let me get away with these things. Plus two fifths. Now we're ready. I'm going to zoom six. That just fixes the screen. OK, I'll take a picture of this and then label it. Okay, this is f of x. And this is f inverse of x. And then this one is the line y equals x. See how the reflections of each other across the line y equals x. That's the effect of switching their x's and y's. Okay. Now, for this one-to-one -one function, find the inverse, give the domain and range for f and f inverse, and then graph both the functions on the same axis. Hmm. Okay, well, let's find f and f inverse first. Now, first, let me say, well, you'll be able to tell from the graph what the domain is. So, f of x equals one fourth times x to the third minus five. So step one, y equals one fourth x to the third minus five.
Step two. X equals one fourth Y to the third minus five. Step three. Solve for Y. So I'm going to start doing that. Let me write it again. And think about my strategy for getting Y to the third and then Y all by itself. The first and easiest thing to do is to add five to both sides of the equation. So that over on the right, negative five plus five will equal zero, and I'll be left with one fourth y to the third, that's one fourth times y to the third, equals x plus five. Okay, now the next thing. I need to get rid of this number. That is, I need to make it disappear over here by y to the third. But I can't just make it disappear, of course, so I have to do this legally. If I multiply both sides of the equation by the reciprocal of one fourth, Okay, the reciprocal, recip, of one-fourth is four over one, which is four. So if I multiply both sides of this equation by four, I'll be able to make the one-fourth vanish on the right-hand side. Okay, here we go four times, parentheses, x plus five, parentheses close, equals four over one times one over four, because one over four is a fraction, so I wrote four as four over one, since they're the same number, times y to the third. The reason I wanted to write four as four over one is because when you multiply fractions, if this number matches this number, which it does, they cancel out, leaving me with one over one, which is one, y to the third. And one y to the third is y to the third. So over here we'll have four x plus 20. So 4x plus 20 equals y to the third. We're almost done. I need to get y by itself. Nobody really cares what y cubed equals, so I'm going to have to take the cube root, the third root, of both sides of the equation. So cube root of 4x plus 20 equals cube root of y to the third power, which is y to that 3 divided by that 3, which is y to the 1, which is y. So, y equals the cube root of 4x plus 20. And that means, step four, f inverse of x equals the cube root of 4x plus 20.
Ta-da! Now I have one more thing to show you, and that is the official proof that two functions are inverses of each other. So, to do it with this one or with that one. We'll do it with both. Here's the official proof. In case anybody ever walks up to you on the street and says, well, prove to me that those two functions are really inverses of each other. And you'll just pull out your pad and pencil and poof, You'll do it. Here it is. If F and F inverse are inverse functions of each other. In fact, let's just say two functions. If F of X and G of X, let's do it that way. That way I don't have to write all those inverses. If f of x and g of x are inverse functions of each other, Then, F circle G of X, this is what we did yesterday, F circle G of X will equal X and, very important, and G circle F of X will also equal X. If both of those things don't happen, then you made a boo-boo somewhere. Or I did. So let's, let's see how this works. I'm going to let F of X be the seventh root of X minus four, and G of X be, the, uh, be X to the seventh plus four. four. Okay, so, and then I'll go back and check and make sure. F of X equals the seventh root of X minus four and G of X equals X to the seventh plus four. Let me make sure I wrote those correctly. OK. Now, I am going to find the composite of F with G. Actually, I don't know which one comes first. I'm going to composite both functions both ways. So F circle G of X. Remember, that will make F be the shell on the outside and g of x will be in it. Okay, so we've got f of x equals the seventh root of x minus four, and f of g of x is going to equal the seventh root of g of x minus four. So g of x is x to the seventh plus four. 
So this is going to be the seventh root of x to the seventh power plus four. That's what g of x is. And then there's this minus four coming in behind. So four minus four is zero, leaving me with the seventh root of x to the seventh power, which is x to the seven, oops, seven over seven, which is x to the one, which is x. Tra-la. We still have to go the other way though. G circle F of X equals a G of F of X. Which is going to be, let's write it up here. If G of X is x to the seventh plus four, then g of f of x is going to be f of x to the seventh power plus four. Well, f of x is the seventh root of x minus 4. Now to the seventh power plus 4. So we're going to have x minus 4 in parentheses to the 7 over 7 power plus 4. Well, 7 over 7 is 1. So we'll have x minus 4 plus 4, which is x. So, g circle f of x equals x, and f circle g of x equals x. So let me write that here, f circle g of x equals x. So we have proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that our two functions are indeed inverses of each other. I'm not going to ask you to do that, but that is part of it. Just so you know, if you go on and take higher level classes. And I don't think we need to do it again. You've seen it. Why don't we just say I am done for today and I can now open up this class to any questions you might have after I save this document. There you go. First, are there, do you want to discuss anything about what we did today? Oh, I didn't graph them. Give the domain and range. I didn't do that. Bad, bad me. You tell me, what is the do domain of one-fourth x to the third minus five? The three questions you ask yourself. Do I see a denominator with an x in it? No. Do I see any fraction exponents? No. Do I see any square roots or fourth roots with an X underneath? 
And the answer is no. So guess what? There is nothing to prevent this domain from being negative infinity to positive infinity. Well, what about this? Cube root, that could be questionable. Let's look. Clear, clear, clear. Let's check out the cube root. I already know the answer. Um, the cube root of 4x plus 20, but I want to convince you. So the cube root, cube root is in here. Luckily, there's already one cooked up for you at number four, right there, the cube root of, the cube root of something, 4x plus 20, 4x plus 20. So 4x plus 20, jump to the outside. Now I'm gonna graph it. This is going to keep going forever to the left and forever to the right. Therefore, the domain of F inverse of X here is negative infinity to positive infinity. So we found that. And now we have to graph them on the same axis. Wow, well, okay. Then, no, that's wrong. Here, I've already graphed one of them. Um, which one did I graph? I graphed the inverse. So let's come down here and graph parentheses, one divided by four. Ah. one divided by four times x to the third come down ah, what is it one fourth x to the is this the one i'm doing yeah one fourth x to the third minus five. One fourth x to the third come down minus five. I didn't need that paren, did I? But oh well. In for a penny, in for a pound, I guess. Yeah. All right. Now let's uh, let's add y equals x to the mix. Yep. Yepper. Yepper. There are the graphs, and they are indeed mirror images of each other across the line y equals x. So for instance, the x-intercept here is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. The y-intercept down here is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5. Which is what you would expect if they're switching their x's and their y's. 
OK. All right, this is it. And it's Thursday, which means this is the beginning of your weekend and my weekend, actually, except I work on Saturday. 